Ambassador Series is brought to you in part by Prairie Heart Institute, the University of Illinois at Springfield, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ed Strong, part of the team at WSCC Television, and very happy to welcome you to this edition of the Ambassador Series. It is very nice that the Ambassador Series is now in its ninth year. It is brought about by a cooperative venture between WSCC Television, the PBS station in Springfield, and the University of Illinois Springfield. We have been able to bring to you and will continue to bring to you ambassadors from various countries around the world. We are supported by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers such as you in order to bring programs that will educate, inform, and entertain. It is nice to have with us today, in addition to our featured guest, the Council General of Chicago, Mr. Willem Schiff, and with him, Martin Borman, who is the Area Director of the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency. Would you two gentlemen please uh, be recognized? Thank you. We are also pleased to have a table of students from Springfield Southeast High School, and they are uh, escorted here by their teacher, Brad Leininger, and that table is made possible by a gift from Roland Machinery. Please recognize our student guests. I would like to introduce to you the head table. To my right and your left is Dr. Gerald Grubel, the President and CEO of WSEC TV and Network Knowledge, Jerry Grubel. I will save the introduction of Ambassador Jones' boss for just a moment from now, and next to her is seated D uh, Chancellor Richard Ringhausen, who is the Chancellor of the University of Illinois Springfield. We are delighted to have the support of the University of Illinois Springfield and WSEC TV to make this program possible. We are also <laughs> we are also very pleased to have had the inspiration, dedication, and support of Henry Dale Smith and the H.D. Smith Company that has helped to make this series not only possible, but better and better year by year. Thank you very much. As we have done in the past, we have been able to secure a very apt and capable person to speak to us about her country, the Netherlands, and many of you, uh, I'm sure, associate uh, the Netherlands with uh, a variety of things, tulips uh, not being the least among them. Uh, but the Netherlands has played a very vital role in Europe, being part of the original group of countries uh, that joined together to create Benelux, that later became part of the common market, that are now a very important part of the European community. Ambassador Rene Jones Boss is married to Dr. Richard Jones. They have two children. She began her education at the gymnasium in Zeist in Holland. She studied at the university in Italy and also in Belgium. And then she went to the United Kingdom to the University of Sussex, where she earned her Master of Arts degree in Russian studies. She has served in a variety of diplomatic posts, 
uh, including one in Moscow. Uh, she also was the first secretary at the Dutch Embassy in Washington, D.C. from 1989 to 1990. She had another career shift to the Czech Republic, and then she became the ambassador at large for human rights from 2000 to 2003. She became the assistant and then the director general for regional policy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and since 2008, she has been the ambassador of the Netherlands to the United States. She is on the board of supervisors of Leiden University uh, Medical Center. And uh, well, one of the more interesting things that I noted in her biography was that she translated Thomas Hardy's book, his uh, masterpiece, uh, The Mayor of Casterbridge, or The Life and Death of the Mayor of Casterbridge, uh, which was written in 1886. Much more recently, she translated the book from English into Dutch. Uh, so she has accomplished in a variety of ways. Please give her a Springfield welcome, Ambassador Renee Jones Boss. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, um, uh, Ed, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, Dr. Grobel, uh, Chancellor Ringeisen, uh, everybody here. It's such a great honor and pleasure for me to be here in Springfield. Uh, I had a wonderful trip up from St. Louis together with Ed, so I've learned a lot about Illinois politics. And I say, you live, <laughs> you live in an interesting state. Uh, 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 so uh, it's, uh, you know, as ambassador to the United States, you're based in Washington. And it's so important to get out of the beltway once in a while. A lot of interesting things happen in Washington uh, as well, I can assure you. But, you know, this country is, is so great, literally and figuratively. It's such a huge country. And it's important to also keep in close touch with other parts of the United States. So thank you so much for welcoming me here. And I felt certainly very welcome indeed. I visited the, uh, President Lincoln's museum this morning uh, and what an inspirational figure he was and still is, I think, for many people. But what a tough time he had as well. You know, going to that exhibition and reading, looking at the cartoons, for example, that were made about him, you think, well, nothing that much has changed in politics. <laughs> it's always hard to be President of the United States of America. So, um, here I am, and, and very happy to tell you a little bit about um, uh, my country, the Netherlands. Um, I thought I'd go a little bit into our shared history, talk a little bit about our shared values, about the close economic ties we have, uh, and about what we can do together in the future. And uh, any questions you have, I'll be extremely happy uh, to answer. So, a little bit of history, you know. Um, uh, Ed just said it, um, what most people know about us is of course the tulips. And if you dig a little bit deeper, maybe the windmills, and if you dig even deeper, you have Rembrandt and Vermeer. And yes, we are very proud of that. But uh, there is so much more to the Netherlands that people here don't know. And I really feel it's my task as ambassador to spread the word a little bit and inform people. Um, we are also very proud of other things. I don't know if you've been watching the Olympics, but we had our skater Sven Kramer, who did extremely well on the five kilometers, did even better on the 10 kilometers, and then took a wrong turn. And so you can imagine that the Dutch newspapers from uh, having headlines the one day Sven Koever, because he was called Sven Kramer, mm -hmm. to deep drama and tragedy. But we survived that as well, and I'm sure we'll survive other things. So our shared history, it started in fact uh, more than 400 years ago. Last year we celebrated the fact that in 1609, a small wooden ship called the Halve Maan, the Half Moon, arrived on this continent. And it was a ship that uh, was sent here by the Dutch East Indies Company. They were looking for a shortcut to China. I think everybody was looking for shortcuts in those days. And they hit this continent. And little did they know what uh, fantastic future that continent would have. So that development, the Dutch ship, Captain Henry Hudson, English captain, uh, led to the establishment of a small trading post called New Amsterdam. 
And New Amsterdam became a larger place, and it was New Netherlands, and it thrived. It was multilingual, it was multiracial. Women could earn property, which was very unusual in those days, and as you can imagine, very much uh, uh, welcomed by me. Um, uh, there were many religions that, that could be practiced, and people could petition the States General in The Hague if they felt that their rights uh, were not met by uh, the governors, and the governors could be tough ones in those days. And Governor Peter Stuyvesant certainly was one of them. So it was a thriving colony, thriving place, and we like to think that some of that entrepreneurial spirit, uh, some of that freedom, because the Dutch uh, pioneers who came here had just been fighting for their freedom as well. We fought our own war of independence against Spain uh, in around 1600. So, you know, we had just shed uh, what we considered the colonial master and we had fought for our independence. So I think that spirit and that, uh, that idea of freedom of liberty, our war was for freedom of religion as well, that really permeated into this society. Uh, of course, then uh, we had a, uh, one of our many wars with the Brits and they had more cannons than we did and they chased us out and the name New Amsterdam became New York and the rest is history. But still, <laughs> our history started there. And then if I skip a little bit in time, uh, we go to 1776, uh, the year of your independence and the first ever salute to the American flag came from a small Dutch Caribbean island of St. Eustatius. And maybe some of you have read Barbara Tuckman's book, The First Salute but it's about the Dutch uh, head of, of that island, the governor, who decided to salute the Stars and Stripes. And then we had uh, John Adams, your second president, but he was the first ambassador to the United States, so a colleague of mine, really, and I'm very proud to, to call John Adams a colleague. He went to the Netherlands. Uh, he found a lot in common also. He said this country is, uh, you know, it's two histories, but like one spirit because there were so many things that he found in common. But he also talked to the Dutch bankers, and he managed to secure the first loan ever to the independent United States, and it helped finance your struggle against Britain. I think it was used for buying arms, but I don't know if we want to know what that money was used for now. But <laughs> he did manage to get the loan, and I can tell you it was not easy, because Dutch bankers have a reputation for being very stingy, and they have it now, and they had it right then, so he had to work very hard for that. And then uh, the Louisiana Purchase uh, was financed by loans from the Dutch bankers as well. Uh, so our history, I think, over all those 400 years developed. We always had close economic ties, we traded together, you had periods of being more inward looking, we did. But of course, all of that ended with uh, the World Wars, and particularly the Second World War. We in the Netherlands will never forget what the Americans did for us, the American servicemen who, who gave their lives for the liberation of the Netherlands, and we talked about that in the car as well. We still have a, a memorial in Margraten in Limburg, uh, graves of American servicemen that are tended uh, by and, and looked after by Dutch families. And, and so, you know, we, we feel so close to you and we feel that our histories are so closely interlinked and it's important because history determines to a certain extent what we are and, and says something about our identity and our spirits. So I think from that shared history, we have a, a lot of shared values. And I mentioned already that the first Dutch pioneers were certainly great entrepreneurs. And I, I, I recognize that here as well, the great American entrepreneurial spirit, uh, but also the importance you attach to, uh, to freedom. And, of course, one of our other legacies that we left here was some presidents. Van Buren uh, was of Dutch origin, but so were Teddy Roosevelt and, uh, and President FDR Roosevelt. And uh, Franklin Roosevelt, so well known in the Netherlands for the four freedoms, you know, freedom of speech and freedom of religion, freedom from want and freedom from fear, that every year in the Netherlands, in Middelburg, in Zeeland, where his family comes from originally, we celebrate the four freedoms and we celebrate the tie uh, with the United States. So values are important. And, and well, how do you deal with values? You, you do that by working together. We work together with our American colleagues in many parts of the world on human rights issues, for example. And uh, well, one of my previous functions was indeed ambassador at large for human rights, and I had very close ties with my Dutch colleagues. Uh, we have the promotion of international law in our constitution. So, you know, we are, uh, we, we are uh, obliged and, and it's our duty 
uh, to help uh, contribute to the, to the promotion of international law, peace and stability. And we have in The Hague, uh, which is where the Dutch government uh, is, is uh, established, uh, The Hague is sometimes called the international legal capital of the world, because we have the World Court there, but also the new International Criminal Court and uh, tribunals such as the Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia. So a lot of international criminal uh, and legal institutions are coming together in The Hague. And of course, uh, fighting for our values, we do in the framework of organizations like NATO. And uh, it is what we do right now in Afghanistan. And maybe I should say a few words about Afghanistan and maybe a few words also about uh, the Dutch government because you all read the newspapers and you probably have seen that the Dutch government fell a week ago. I didn't know that when I accepted uh, this invitation, uh, but I would have come anyway because uh, the government falls but life goes on and, and Springfield couldn't wait for that. But what happened is that we have been very heavily invested and involved in Afghanistan since the start. We were uh, initially up in the north, uh, in Baglan. In 2005-2006 uh, we moved to the south and as you know from, from your television and your military that's a very tough part. We went to the province of Uruzgan mm -hmm. where we were lead nation uh, together with some other countries, Denmark, Canadians, the Brits of that province of Uruzgan. And we really contributed a lot in terms of uh, blood, sacrifice of our soldiers, money. Uh, we made huge aid contributions to Afghanistan and it was a tough call for our government to make. So in 2007, uh, when the extension of the mission was debated, Parliament said, you know, it's enough, we're a small country, we have a small army, a good army, but uh, maybe it's time that some other countries took over and do some of the heavy lifting. And that's a debate that I recognize that you sometimes have here as well, you know, why should it always be us? Well, we also in the Netherlands sometimes have the feeling, why should it always be us? Anyway, government at the time decided we will go for one more extension till 2010 and then we phase out to the end of the year. Then of course we had elections in America, we had a new president, there was a new strategy and uh, NATO and, and, uh, and, and ISAF, the international force, asked us to stay. And that led to a huge debate in the government, you know, some parties that said, we always have coalition parties by the way, so there's three parties in our government. We have to stay because, you know, this is a, a, a responsibility we need to take. Another party that said, we've done so much of our share, uh, we really can't do this anymore and it's time that others uh, take part of the share. And that led to the departure of one of the parties from the government, the party that didn't want to stay in, in Uruzgan in Afghanistan. So we now have a care, caretaker government. We will um, uh, stay at least uh, till the end of this year. We will have elections in June and then the new government will have to decide how to go on from this. So if you have any more questions about Afghanistan or the government or the election system or whatever in the Netherlands, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to go into that. So anyway, there we are. But, you know, tied by history, tied by values, tied by fighting wars uh, as in NATO. Uh, but we're also very much tied uh, by economic ties. And uh, yeah, certainly since the crisis hit and I arrived in autumn 2008, just about the time when Lehman Brothers had just uh, fallen and when the economic crisis uh, got very bad here, it also affected us because we're an open economy. Um, when I got here the first week in September, the Prime Minister visited and he gave a speech where he said we have a budget surplus, which was true at the time. We have 3.5% unemployment and we have only 40% uh, uh, national debt. So we had very good economic figures. Half a year later, economic collapse everywhere. We now have a 6% budget deficit. Our national debt has risen to 65% and unemployment has gone up to 6%. It's still relatively uh, reasonable if you compare it to many other countries but so we've gone through very difficult economic times and in these economic times all the more important to stick together but let me just give you a few uh, facts and figures uh, do you know uh, which countries are the biggest investors in the United States could you name the top three anybody China I hear Japan I hear Britain, well, you're very close, but you're missing one country, the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> we are the third investor in the United States. So Japan and Britain are indeed the first. And China, of course, holds a lot of your uh, bonds. And uh, well, I won't go into that. But uh, we are the third largest investor. And what about Illinois? 
What do you think? Who is, uh, who is the top five of investors in Illinois? Never one. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, I don't know if we'd like to buy it yet, but uh, I'll consider at the end of the visit. But there's a quick learner over there. We are the fifth investor in, uh, in Illinois. So, you know, pretty uh, close, uh, close economic ties here as well. So how many jobs do you think are created by Dutch trade and Dutch investment in the United States? We've tried to work this out. Of course, it's very difficult to do it precisely, but if you look at Dutch investment and if you look at trade towards the Netherlands, we're the seventh trading partner of the United States, we think that almost close to a million American jobs are created by trade and investment uh, with the Netherlands and through the Netherlands. So, you know, that, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty substantial. And that for a country, my country is about uh, twice the size of New Jersey. It's a very small area of land. Uh, but, but it's uh, because we've always had that, uh, that open trading mind and that open trading spirit and that open economy goes back to the 400 years. Well, the trade relationship is visible in your daily life. Every time you buy Heineken beer or you buy Shell Gas or you buy Philips Electronics. And I know those companies sometimes like to say, you know, when you're Philips, obviously when you're America, you want to be an American company. But I can tell you their headquarters are in the Netherlands and they come from the Netherlands. <laughs> and so does Shell. Uh, and so does Heineken. Uh, but even products such as Ben and & Jerry's and Skippy Peanut Butter uh, are owned now by Dutch companies. But the other way around, the uh, uh, United States is an extremely important investor in the Netherlands. You are the number one investor uh, in our country. So that's extremely important for us because that creates jobs. You have a lot of American companies like uh, Cisco, FedEx, um, Nike, they see the Netherlands as the gateway to Europe. So they often have their uh, headquarters, uh, their European headquarters in the Netherlands, or they have their distribution systems in the Netherlands. Because we are close to the sea and we have three big rivers. We have the biggest port in Europe, Rotterdam, and we have Schiphol Airport, which connects you very easily to the rest of the continent. So. Uh, American companies like to do business in the Netherlands and Dutch companies really like to do business in the United States. And I think American companies like it because we have a, a, a good corporate tax structure. It's all above board. We are not a tax haven. We've had our fights with uh, the Treasury Department about that. It's all uh, according to OECD uh, guidelines. But we also have a multi-skilled workforce. People speak different languages. Uh, as I said, we are very easy to reach uh, from all over Europe. Uh, we have very good telecommunications. I think the Dutch have the, uh, the, the, the most broadband and inter internet connections of anybody anywhere in the world. So both the physical and the IT infrastructure are very good. So the economists rank the Netherlands as one of the best countries in which to do business. And of course, we're very pleased with that. And we are one of the few countries, I think, that buys more from the United States, that sells more to you. So that should make you happy as well because Right? As the President said in the State of the Union, you need to export more and sell more in order to create more jobs here in the United States. So we strongly believe in the benefits of international trade and investment. Um, you know, as, as I said, I think without uh, investment and trade, we would all be worse off. There would be loss, less jobs, uh, there would be less wealth, and we would all be doing less well. So that's why we are working very much for open markets. Uh, we believe in the importance of trade agreements. Uh, we would like there to be uh, a, a good end to the WTO uh, negotiations that are taking place. And we also think it's very important to have a, a level playing field. So the ground is clear uh, in the same way for business everywhere. So the financial crisis has infected us very much as well. Uh, we're trying to take measures with our banks. The Dutch government had to bail out a couple of big banks. Uh, we are in the top 10 of the financial centers in the world because we have big banks that operate internationally. You might know ING Direct uh, that started here in the United States. They started a few years ago from scratch and I think they now have 7 million customers. But it has cost the, Ameri the Dutch taxpayer money as well to bail out those banks. We are part of the G20 process. Uh, we were invited, first of all, by President Bush to Washington and, and this last time by President Obama to come to Pittsburgh. And we believe it's very important to work together internationally to try and solve those economic and financial crises. And we are very confident that 2010 
growth is picking up in the Netherlands, we want to keep unemployment as low as possible and we want to bring our budget deficit down as quickly as we can. So uh, that brings us to, you know, we've had the past, we've had the economy, we've had, uh, we've had the values, but what about the future? And of course we all need to think about the future and one area of the future that we are very concerned about is water. The, the, the rising level of water. And as you can imagine in the Netherlands, where about two thirds of our country is at or below sea level. So rising water has an immediate impact on us. Uh, we've been struggling with water for 800 years. So we've uh, collected a bit of experience in those uh, 800 years. But it's also an area where we work very closely together now with the United States. After the disaster of Katrina and Rita, the big hurricane struck Louisiana, uh, the Dutch engineers came with some very heavy pumps, first of all, to just help you know, pump out the water. But that's now developed into uh, a far bigger relationship, which is called Dutch Dialogues. And it's all about living with water. And we've discovered uh, in our experience over those last 800 years that you can't keep on building dikes higher and higher. You have to look at what, where the water is coming from. And in our case, it comes from our back, the three big rivers, through Germany, Switzerland, and it comes from the front, the North Sea. Uh, so you can't keep on building your dikes high, you have to create space for the water. So we've now really changed our paradigm and mindset. Yes, we do still build dike and levees, and we have very innovative and, and advanced engineering, but we also create more ponds, broader rivers. We don't build in certain places anymore. And uh, well, we, 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 we want to share this experience with, um, with other countries. In 1953, we had a very bad flood in the Netherlands that was in Zeeland, in the same province that the family of President Roosevelt comes from. My family lived there at the time as well. And my parents had to evacuate their house from the second floor in a little rowing boat. And when we were children, we thought this was a very exciting story. But you know, when you go through it, and we had so many victim, victims as a result of that flood as well, you realize how hard the fight against the water is and how extremely important uh, the fight against the water is. Um, so we're not only sharing this experience with Katrina now, uh, with uh, Louisiana now, but also with uh, St. Louis. I was yesterday at uh, University, Washington University of St. Louis and there the Department of Urban Design and Architecture is also looking at ways of uh, how we can work together and bring in skill and expertise from both sides. And we can also learn an awful lot from you, by the way, because if you look at um, the strength of the phenomenon, the winds are always windier here in the United States. The water is more in the United States. You know, the extremes in climate conditions that you have to face are a lot more extreme than what we have to face. So I think our engineers learn a lot from you as well. So it's really a two-way stream. Anyway, um, uh, I could tell you an awful lot more about my country, about our relationship. I think it's also important to mention that uh, the great European integration project, which we started um, uh, yeah, more than, than 60 years ago now, after the Second World War. And I still think that's something that we as Europeans are very proud of. You know, we fought so many wars on our continent, and that's why so many of your ancestors left the European continent to escape that war and all that violence. And if you see now that we've created a common market, an integrated market, uh, that we've extended the European Union to countries of Central and Eastern Europe, that before were in, you know, on the other side, in the, in, in the, on, in the East Bloc, behind the Iron Curtain, and that we have created prosperity and stability uh, for almost 500 million people within the European Union. I think that's a, a very important achievement. And for a country like my own, the Netherlands, it's extremely important to be part of that European effort. So thank you very much. Uh, our, our relation is strong. Uh, our ties are strong. Uh, and I really hope that uh, they will continue to be so. I certainly will, as ambassador of the Netherlands to the United States and together with with Willem Schiff and the other Consuls General work very hard to make them so. It's a great pleasure to be here. You know, as a Dutch person, you feel always very much at ease and at home in the United States because you're just very friendly and nice and kind people. And, uh, and, and that is why Dutch people like to come here, why Dutch business likes to come here. And that's why for me, I really felt that today uh, in Illinois and here in Springfield, uh, that, uh, that, that warm and friendly spirit. And uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, thank you for having me here in Springfield, Illinois.
Thank you very much, Ambassador. I, I promised the Ambassador that we would be very careful about the kind of questions we ask and not to put her in a, a very difficult situation. But the first question, uh, Ambassador, that has, that has occurred is, uh, can you speak to the status of your speed skating coach who told the Netherlands <laughs> skater to move to the wrong lane? <laughs> well, this is the most difficult question you could have asked me. <laughs> but, well, I tell you what, it, as I said, it was a national tragedy and the country was in mourning. But uh, when it comes down to it, to it, we have quite a resilient spirit as well. And Sven Kramer, the skater, had a good talk with his coach and he decided to stick with his coach. Right, and not kind of walk out in a half or in anger because it was the coach who, who made the decision. And then an endless amount of jokes and cartoons came up. You know, like uh, we have a whole series of job ads. You see, you see a person thinking, you know, what do I want to do in life? And then it says, and suddenly I got it. I want to be a train driver or I want to be uh, a, an engineer. Anyway, so you saw pictures, cartoons of this coach you know, thinking, say, suddenly I've got it. I think I want to be a train driver as well because <laughs> clearly my coaching career has come to an end. So I think people got over it. They've taken it uh, in their strides. Nothing we can do. We have to wait four more years till the next Olympic Games. And at least the good news is that Sven Kramer and his coach are still together. So I think that's, uh, that shows what a, a good relationship they had despite all the problems. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. Now, an easy question. Uh, given the uh, turmoil, financial turmoil in the world, and uh, more specifically in Greece, uh, could you please comment on the European approach to trying to solve the problems that Greece has created for the European community? Well, Greece, as you know, is a part of the Eurozone, so the countries who have joined the Euro. That is not the case with all countries in Europe, so that makes it a little bit complicated as well. It's not an issue that concerns all EU countries, but only those countries that joined the Eurozone. Well, the Netherlands is one of those countries that did so. So what happens in one country, in this case Greece, affects uh, what happens in other countries. Um, the Dutch uh, parliament and the Dutch uh, public opinion I have to be honest about it, is a little bit negative because they say, well, we've worked very hard, we're great savers, we're quite a thrifty nation, uh, you know, we try to bring back our deficit as soon as we can, we've taken tough measures the last few years and, you know, now we have to bail out a country that maybe has not been as thrifty, has not uh, taken the, the, the measures to cut back the budget, so, you know, is that fair? But on the other hand, we're in this together. And, uh, and, and the Dutch government will have a serious look together with the other Eurogroup governments. The Greek, the Greek um, uh, government will come with a proposal, half March, and the other countries in the Eurogroup will look at that, and then they will decide what to do. But if you look in, in real truth at countries that will be probably called upon to help out, uh, that'll be, in any case, Germany, because that's the biggest economy in Europe, but also France. And then the third country they'll probably look at is the Netherlands. So it is something that we will have to face and we will face. Uh, some people say you should look at the IMF. Uh, we have no strong feelings about it. We think the IMF has very good expertise and skill in looking at you know, budget systems of countries and possibilities for uh, adjustment of government expenditure. But well, let's see what happens at half March. But I'm confident that um, we, will, we will work it out because we've been in the Eurozone long enough and we will have to, we have no choice. A lot of us have no choice in regard to financial issues uh, of late. Uh, this past week, there was a very violent storm that uh, went through, uh, through Europe. And uh, apparently a seawall collapsed in France. So the question that is being raised is what's the status of the protection uh, as well as the status of the current polders that have been created in the Netherlands? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, we are, our dikes and seawalls suffered no damage. But maybe it's good to go back to what I said. We had this massive flood in 53 that really affected a large part of the country. And we then decided that, you know, this, this should not happen again. 
and we made a very long-term plan called the Delta Plan. And it was not just one levy or one dike, but it was a, an integrated plan that looked at the entire coastal area, uh, the dunes, the dikes. Uh, we built uh, new bridges with seawalls that can be pulled up and down depending on the level of the, the waves. So we had this very long-term integrated plan that took us about 50, 60 years to complete. And we've just had a, a new committee look at our, uh, our sea and water defenses, the committee Veerman, a former minister in the Netherlands, and they've decided that there should be another 100-year plan, so another very long-term plan, to look at future uh, sea level rises, storms, winds and, and, and rivers that go up. So we consider it very important to take a long-term view. These are great big infrastructural works. You can't do them one year this and the other year that. You know, start in, on the north, do something in the south. You have to look at it in an integrated way. And you have to involve the federal authorities, the provincial authorities and the city authorities. And we in Holland, we like to call that the polder model. Because when we first started drying our land, you know, we, we are basically a delta, a morass. Uh, but we, we dried a lot of, of the land. And you can only do that and maintain it if everybody cooperates. Because you can't have just one windmill going and not the three or four others, because then the whole polder drowns, right? So you have to make sure that everybody takes their share, their burden, and, and, and sticks to their part of the bargain. So the polder model is what works if everybody works together towards a certain aim. And I think that is what will get us through uh, the, the possib possibilities of sea uh, levels rising, water levels rising, we will make another long-term plan, we will invest over the years and we will do it in a, in a collaborative way, because the only way you can do, that's the only way you can win the fight with water. We, uh, we all suffered through the uh, Christmas Eve bombing attempt <coughs> on a flight that came from your country. Uh, I believe that it was uh, uh, one of your countrymen who assisted in bringing the would-be bomber down uh, from his, his attempt. But the question is, uh, at uh, Schiphol Airport, what kind of new security measures have been implemented uh, because your country and our country share alike that transatlantic channel and uh, both have risks in regard to international terrorism? <clears throat> Uh, we work very closely together uh, with your country in the fight against uh, terrorism. That's one of the other areas that I could have mentioned and maybe should have mentioned. Um, our Minister of, uh, of Justice and Homeland Security has close ties with uh, Mrs. Napolitano, the Secretary for Homeland Security, and with uh, uh, Eric Holder, the Attorney General. And what happened immediately after the events, they got in touch. Uh, they discussed what had happened. We had uh, an FBI team in Amsterdam. There was a Dutch police team came to, uh, to, uh, to the United States. So the cooperation immediately that already existed, uh, that's already there, immediately went into higher gear. We've had since then a number of uh, congressional delegations. We've had people from Homeland Security inspecting Schiphol Airport and looking at it. Schiphol Airport is actually one of the safer airports in the world. And that was also said by some commentators on, on television here. Um, we had uh, those millimeter weave scans that there's so much discussion about now. Uh, but uh, at the time, uh, for all kinds of reasons, uh, people did not yet want us to use those on American flights. But we have them and we've installed them. We've bought uh, 60 more uh, millimeter wave scans. Uh, so that should contribute to security. Um, we have very uh, uh, good intelligence uh, cooperation because, of course, it's often better to, to find out through intelligence channels what's happening rather than just having to send people through metal detectors and, and other uh, uh, scans. Uh, and, and we do believe that through our close cooperation between all of our different services and on the federal level, um, yeah, we, 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 we work as closely together as we can to prevent this kind of thing happening. Um, the person uh, was not on the list, uh, well you followed the whole discussion here as well, so there was no reason for the Dutch authorities not to allow him on because he was not on that no-fly list. Uh, so yeah, it, these are very difficult issues and it's also very difficult to find a good balance between security, safety, which is in, to the, uh, important for all of us, 
but also free travel, which is also important for all of us because we like you to come to us and, and, uh, and, and, and we like to come here. So we have to find a balance between the two. Uh, it was indeed a Dutchman, Jasper Schuringa, who, uh, who immediately reacted when he saw something happening and he jumped on the guy uh, and he wrestled him down and I think together with the crew and other passengers they managed to, uh, to control uh, the suspect and uh, well, I'm very glad he did that and we're very proud of his, uh, his quick reaction. I suppose that question perhaps leads to another question that's been raised. That is, you're, you have a very welcoming, open country, and you, of course, in the past served as ambassador at large for human rights. Could you please comment about the Islamic population uh, in your country and what kinds of lessons maybe that you have learned that you could share with other countries who maybe have not fared quite as well as have you? We, um, unlike the United States, you've always been an immigration country. So people came here from all over the place. We've always had small immigration because we were often a refuge for people who had to flee, you know, for reasons of belief or religion. We had the Huguenots from France came to the Netherlands, people like Descartes and Spinoza. Uh, we ha had a lot of Jewish people coming to the Netherlands to find refuge. So we did have that tradition. But what happened about 20, 25 years ago is that we had large-scale immigration for the labor market, so low-skilled uh, immigration, mainly from countries like Morocco and Turkey. And they were called at the time guest workers because we thought they would come temporarily as guests, work for a few years, earn money, and then go back to their countries. But of course they didn't, and because we have very liberal immigration systems, certainly at the time, once people decided to stay, they were welcome to stay, and then they were welcome to bring their uh, wives and then their children and their cousins and other family members. So within a fairly short period of time, we went from um, uh, yeah, having hardly any people from uh, Muslim countries to now about approximately 900,000, almost 1 million out of 16 and a half million people in the Netherlands are from Muslim countries, so Turkey, Morocco, but also Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, partly through the asylum uh, system. We had a very open asylum system where people were welcome and, and that could be used, and through this guest workers program. And for a long time that went well, and we have a, a, a tradition of tolerance, and everybody went their own way and you know did what they had to do. But at a certain point, uh, it started to cause problems, certainly in the bigger cities because most of the immigrant population lives in the bigger cities. A lot of them were low-skilled, often illiterate. Uh, a lot of them did not participate in the workforce, did not participate in society. And you got separate islands, almost, so to say, in the cities of people that were not part of Dutch society. And that became a real political issue in around 2000, 2001. We had a politician then called Pim Fortuyn who raised that issue. And a lot of people had been really angry over the years. A kind of anger had built up, like, why don't politicians pay attention to this, right? Why do they pretend that nothing has changed and happened when now from, you know, uh, nothing, we suddenly have yeah. almost one million people from countries with a totally different religion, tradition, etc., in our country. And it was difficult for us because I think Dutch people like to be welcoming and open and like to uh, welcome people from other countries, but it became a social and, an, and, a, and, a, and also a, a criminal issue because a lot of crime was being committed by the immigrant communities. So I think uh, the government that we have now uh, of Prime Minister Balke and uh, decided to tackle this issue, say, okay, we, you know, you can't ignore it. We have to face it. We have to have a discussion about it. We also have to decide what it means to be Dutch if you come to the Netherlands. Uh, things with us had always be, been a lot more implicit than with you, right? When you come to America, you have to learn the national anthem and pledge allegiance to the flag and you have to know the constitutions because you are an immigrant country. But because we were not a large-scale immigrant country, these things were, you know, people knew more or less what it meant to be Dutch and it was not a, a thing that was debated so strongly. So I really think we've gone through a couple of difficult years where it was debated very strongly what it means to be Dutch what do we expect from people who come to our society, you know, that it is important to learn the language. I mean, you can't communicate and you can't work and you can't help your children with their schoolwork 
if you don't speak the language of the country uh, where you've come. So uh, we've invested in the inner cities, uh, we've invested in housing, in educational programs, in language programs, uh, but also in, for example, mentoring uh, programs. It was hard for immigrant communities to get the right jobs, to, to find their way into, uh, for example, the civil service. And I, I see really things changing uh, for the better. If you look at the statistics, you see that where in 1990, 95, maybe 5% of immigrant population went to university, it is now 45 to 50 percent. So it's a, it's a dramatic increase and I think schooling is so important because you know once you have an education it is so much easier to to join in society and to be part of that society. We now have a lot of members of parliament who are of Turkish, of Moroccan or Iranian or uh, or uh, Iraqi background. We have uh, we had two ministers in the cabinet that's just full government ministers, one of Turkish background, a woman who is the Minister for Immigration, so a very difficult and sensitive issue, which she did really well, and the Minister for Social Affairs, now the Mayor of Rotterdam, uh, Abu Talib. So I think we've gone through a difficult period. I do think we're on the right path. I do think it will take some time to find a new balance uh, in our society. We're not there yet, but I, I really do think we're moving in the right direction. Your country is relatively flat, uh, but it has a lot of bicycles. And uh, bicycles seem to be a primary mode of transportation. Does the government have any policies, uh, either by virtue of taxation on gasoline or uh, other policies that encourage a reduction in the use of automobiles uh, and uh, an increase in the use of bicycles? Well. My country is as flat as it is here. That's why I felt so much at home <laughs> driving up here. I thought, great, you know, it's as flat as Holland. You can see the sky. Um, yeah, bicycling is a big thing in the Netherlands. Everybody bicycles, from government ministers to school kids. I mean, it is really the way of transportation. And it has to be safe. So in every city, in every village, in every countryside, you'll see that there are bicycle lanes. There are very strict laws. Uh, cars, you know, always have to give way to bicycles, otherwise you get accidents. Uh, so people are not afraid to go on their bikes. But you see lady going out for a lunch meeting, you know, in their smart clothes, but a plastic hat on their head and to keep their ha hair dry and in order. Uh, we have a government minister, Minister Donner, a uh, very serious man, always in a three-piece suit and looking very smart but he bicycles to his ministry. So it really is the mode. Every Dutch school's child bicycles to school. I bicycle to school, you know, first elementary and then the secondary school was about 10 miles away. And my parents said, right, you can bike 10 miles there, 10 miles back every day. And, um, and only when it was really, really, really bad weather with a lot of snow were we allowed to take the bus. But you know, that was, you're not meant to do that. So, uh, yes, uh, the infrastructure is there. I think that's very important, that uh, there are places where you can bike. Uh, gas is much more expensive in the Netherlands than it is here. So there is a tax on, uh, on petrol for cars. So it discourages people to take the car and, and take the bike. And public transportation, in any case, is something that has been encouraged very much. To give you an example, when I fly in from the United States to Schiphol Airport, it takes me about 15 minutes to get out of the airport, have my suitcase, right, from the, uh, the, the baggage department. Then I can go through an underground connection to the, um, uh, the railway station. Uh, trains go every five to 10 minutes. In half an hour, I'm by train in The Hague, which is where we live. Uh, and you take a bus which drops me off in front of our apartment. And all in all, say within an hour of landing from the United States, I'm with suitcase and everything in my apartment in The Hague. And of course, I've got a bicycle there to use uh, for my meetings whilst I'm in uh, the Netherlands. So I really think it's a wonderful means of transport. It's cheap, uh, it's healthy because you, know, you don't need to go to the gym because you've had your exercise going to work or going to school. Uh, and it's very good for the environment. And when we celebrated our 400 years uh, relationship last year, we donated 250 orange bikes to the city of New York. And the mayor of New York, Mayor Bloomberg, is also really working with the city to create more and more bike paths and bike possibilities, safe places to, 
to put your bike to park it because you don't want it to be stolen, of course. So I would greatly like to encourage all of you to follow the Dutch example and get on your bike. It's good fun, it's a good sport, it's good exercise, and, uh, and you can enjoy the nature around you. Uh, let me conclude the questions, if I may, uh, with something that uh, maybe is a little less savory than uh, bicycle riding. Uh, your country has been noted in recent years for its, uh, I, I won't say relaxed, but its altered laws relative to drug use. Could you comment on the success or failure of the intent of the laws as they were passed? Mm -hmm. Just reading a report on my way here that says that the Netherlands has the lowest cannabis use in, of Europe in all European countries. And that's interesting because, well, cannabis use is prohibited by law, but we have developed a policy where for small scale use, private use, there are places in the country where you can go. And we call them confusingly coffee shops. So <laughs> there are coffee shops where you can get coffee, but there are also coffee shops where you can get cannabis. But you can only get a very small amount. It's for your own use. Uh, it's a controlled environment. Uh, there's also control of you know, hygiene and health and all of that. And it means that people don't have to do it surreptitiously or go and, and, and steal things or go to backyards or whatever. And for us, that policy has worked. We've, you know, with all these things, it's a matter of societal debate. You have to work something out that works for you. And for us, it has worked because it has decreased crime as a result of drug use. It has decreased, interestingly enough, drug use as well. So maybe when it's not as exciting when you can do it legally uh, in a controlled way, it's maybe less interesting and exciting than when you know, you're not allowed to do it. And it has also allowed us to control health risk. We have also very low amount of heroin and cocaine users, and we have programs to try to, to wean people off it by alternative uh, uh, drug use. So it's a controlled environment, and it has worked for us because we've seen a decrease in use by the Dutch population, and we've also seen a, a decrease in petty crime as a result of yeah, the more open way of dealing with it. Ambassador Jones Boss, we have greatly appreciated your comments today. Uh, you've been very informative, uh, and uh, I can understand why you represent your country to the United States of America. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for viewing this program. This has been created in cooperation between WSEC Television, Springfield's PBS station, and the University of Illinois Springfield. Thank you very much. Good night. Ambassador Series is brought to you in part by Prairie Heart Institute, the University of Illinois at Springfield, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of this edition of the Ambassador Series, Send $24.95 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois, 62708. You may also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605. Be sure to include the program name, broadcast date, and topic.